Turn with me to Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> That's where we're going to pick up. That's where we were last week. And uh, we're going to continue to make our way through a bit of chapter 9 and into chapter 10. And as you're sitting there listening to me preach, if it occurs to you to pray for Pastor Richard, please feel free to do that. He's up uh, filling in in one of our sister churches in Sycamus this morning who was uh, short of a preacher. And so it's one of the, the privileges we have of a church family, of being a part of a church uh, a family that extends beyond Vernon to be able to do those kind of things. So uh, we were just happy to be able to, uh, to help in that way. I, I must confess, over the last couple weeks, I've been reminiscing because on my way to work, I come down the highway through town and I pass the Bank of Montreal. And over the last two or three weeks, there has been a, an enormous white car kind of parked right beside the Bank of Montreal that's for sale. Now, it's a Buick of some variety. I can't exactly tell you the model. And every time I drive by it, I, I, I have these memories because we actually used to have a car somewhat like that. But when I was a kid, my parents had a car that was a lot like that, except it was sort of this brownish beige color. And I remember as a kid just feeling like this was something pretty special. Now, we didn't have a lot. We were like many of you, you know, it was kind of pretty uh, day-to-day pretty -day sort of living. But I remember when we got this car feeling like, wow, we have this pretty fancy car. Now, in retrospect, as I realize and think back, I realize it actually wasn't that fancy. It was probably someone's old, you know, second or third or fourth hand car that was, you know, passed along and, and not particularly uh, classy in any sense. But as a kid, it was pretty impressive. And the one trip I remember taking in that car was driving from Barrie, Ontario, where we were living, down to Orlando, Florida. And uh, we, we put that we had a tent trailer, attached the tent trailer, and we, we drove all those miles to, to visit Disneyland and to see the sights on the way. Now, my family sees sights differently than some families. We don't actually believe in stopping and actually getting out and seeing things. We just drive by them. You can, you know, for those of you who know my dad, you can give him a hard time sometime. I've seen almost all of North America from a car window. Uh, it's no joke. It's like, look, kids, there's the Statue of Liberty. There it goes. That was sort of how we grew up. But... Um, Getting to Orlando was uh, a pretty exciting thing. We did Epcot, but the highlight of the trip actually was getting to go swimming and body surfing in the, in the ocean uh, there in Florida. And it was a great day. I still still have quite vivid memories of me with my hair parted in the middle back. This is mid '80s. It was spectacularly cool. Now I just wish I had enough hair to do that. Um, but <coughs> sort of the moment of the day that stands out most was this moment as we were swimming and body surfing when. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, an undercurrent or wave or something spun me upside down and I can still remember standing up and hitting my head on the bottom of the, the beach and realizing I was completely disoriented. Now fortunately, a couple seconds later, I was able to pop up and act like nothing had happened, right? That's what you do when you're grade eight. Uh, never panic, never let them see anything go wrong. But it was sort of this weird moment, and ever since then, it's been for me my go-to analogy whenever, whenever life feels like it's kind of being turned up on its head. And when I come to Mark 8, 9, and 10, that's the thought that enters my mind. It is a scene, one scene, one story after another, one conversation after another, one teaching after another that takes everything that the disciples of Jesus knew, everything that was clear and understood and conventional in, in Jewish thought and Jewish wisdom and, and Jewish heritage, and it just takes the whole thing and flips it upside down and says, there, this is what it now looks like to follow Jesus on the way. So last week we began looking in chapter 8. We saw a number of these things start to emerge. We saw Jesus actually using some language from Isaiah to tell us that his way was going to be different than the way that the people had been used to following. In fact, if you go to your Bible and if you have one of those concordances at the back and look up the word way, you'll find it's used many, many times. Many of them are simply to describe a path or a road. I mean, we still speak of that in this, you know, what way are you going to take to get to your destination? Sometimes scripture uses the term that way, but, but often it uses in a very different way. Instead of speaking as an actual path or route or, or road, it speaks of it more as a, a way in which we do life, a, an attitude, a series of actions, affections, the manner in which we live life, the philosophy in which governs our life, and Jesus uses it as a way to describe what it is going to look like to follow him. And he says, if you want to follow me, understand it's going to be very different 
than the way in which you have been taught, the way in which has been modeled up until this point in your lives. Now that's chapter 8. We ran into a couple stories there that, that help us understand the struggles the disciples are having with this, particularly as Jesus speaks increasingly frankly about his coming death and his burial and his resurrection. And we see that the disciples, they understand partly but not fully. In fact, there's a great miracle that happens uh, near the end of chapter 8 where Jesus heals a blind man. We looked at this last week briefly. The blind man came and he is healed by Jesus but it's only a partial healing and he can see something but not completely and it takes Jesus healing him again to complete the miracle. And, and we're left saying, what, what went wrong? Why couldn't Jesus heal him the first time? And clearly nothing went wrong. Jesus heals him that way as an analogy, as a way to say this is the same thing that's going on in the, the lives and the the hearts of my disciples, they see me in part. They see enough to know he's a man worth following. In fact, as we come to the end of chapter 8, they see him enough that Peter would actually declare that this is the Messiah. But they don't get it all. There's a part of Jesus they just miss. In fact, when Jesus says, yes, Peter, you're right, I am the Messiah, but I must suffer and I must die, that's the moment where Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him and says, no, no, Jesus, you're wrong. You're the Messiah, but Jesus, on this you are wrong. Now please be generous with Peter at this point. Peter would have grown up having read Isaiah 53, which we can read, which speaks in our Bible of the suffering of the Messiah. But to Peter, he would have been reading a very different story because in the Aramaic Old Testament, they actually had changed Isaiah 53. They had actually rewritten it. The Messiah would triumph in their version. Israel would suffer. And so poor Peter... He had just been raised his whole life thinking that there's no way the Messiah, the chosen one, the coming one, the Son of God himself, there's no way he could suffer. That's why he takes Jesus aside only to be corrected so sternly by Jesus who says, get behind me Satan, you're not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. Jesus is in essence saying, Peter, what you are asking of me is to leave the way that I have come to not only live but to model for you and I will not do it. I will not compromise. I will continue down this path of weakness and brokenness and suffering and sacrifice to the ultimate point where I will deny myself, go to a cross and die in your place, Peter. And if I didn't do it, you would be hopelessly and eternally lost. And Jesus turns to his disciples in verse 34 and 35 and says, and not only must I do it, but to follow me, this is what it will look like for you. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross. And you must follow me. Now, at this point, we're left probably expecting one of two things to happen. I suspect. Either at this point, we want to see the disciples get it, and chapter 9 and 10 are just going to be a story of the disciples finally coming to grips with who Jesus is and what he's doing. Or what we're going to see in chapter 9 and 10 are more examples of the fact that the disciples still don't see clarity. Now I'll give you a little hint as we walk into chapter 9 and 10 this morning. It's option number 2. And what Mark is going to show us in these two chapters is just another series of stories that illustrate that the disciples, although they see in part, it's still murky. They still aren't getting who Jesus is and the way in which he is going to triumph in the end. And Jesus determined that they will see, continues to teach, continues to demonstrate, continue, continues to carry out miracles so that they will be absolutely and utterly convinced of the truth of who he is and the way in which he walks. Now, I want to walk through chapter 9 quickly so that we can spend a bit of time in chapter 10. So let me just walk you through this. Please on your own feel free to spend a little bit of time here in chapter 9 so you can kind of come to face to face with some of what's happening. Right on the heels of this great scene of Jesus speaking of what discipleship looks like, of this denial of self and taking up a cross, Jesus goes with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up onto a mountain, and there for a brief moment of time, those men are allowed to see him in his glory. It's like the veil is pulled back, and if ever there's a point where they should finally see clearly, this should be it. They should get to the top of the mountain, and as Jesus in his glory is seen, they should drop to the ground and worship him. That should be what happens. And instead, they get it partly right. Here's what Peter says in verse 5. Rabbi, it's good that we're here. That goes without saying, doesn't it? I mean, there you are. Jesus is being revealed in all his glory. And Peter thinks, 
poof, wow, this is, I'm glad we're here. Then he goes on and says, let's make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now again, it's not that that's a bad thing. He's not suggesting something evil or criminal or immoral. But it's just that slight hint that he just doesn't quite get it. How could he for a second think that Jesus is on par with Moses and Elijah? Let's make three tents, Jesus. One for you and one for your friends. And, and this is a, just a good thing that we're all up here together. And unfortunately, he misses the fact that he is with the one and only Son of God standing in his glorious presence. He sees, just not quite fully. The next story we come to in verse 14 is what's going on while Jesus is up the mountain with these three disciples because the rest of the disciples are down at the bottom of the mountain and at the bottom of the mountain they are being confronted with a, a difficult situation because someone has brought a son to them who is possessed by an unclean or evil spirit. And they come really looking for Jesus to deliver the son but Jesus of course is up the mountain and so the disciples step in and, and say, well we can help you. We can do this. And unfortunately, as we go through the story, it's going to be very obvious, very quickly, that they can't. And they fail utterly. And so Jesus comes down, finding this chaotic scene of these disciples having attempted to do something that they were unable to do. And this poor parent of this son saying, if you can help me, please help my child. And Jesus responds in verse 23 this way. Jesus says to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. There's no if. There's no if here. All things are possible for one who believes. What a great statement, but think of the implication. Think of what it feels like to be one of the disciples who failed in this situation. Think of being one of those nine men who were unable to cast out the unclean spirit only to hear Jesus say all things are possible for those who believe because... Because isn't the implication, you nine men, you didn't believe. They see, but not quite. They see enough to think this is possible. We could step in and intervene. This man, who, this young child who has an unclean spirit can be delivered. They see that much. Just not enough to actually make a difference. Jesus goes through the whole scene. He actually cares for this young child, the unclean spirit comes out. He gets to the end of verse 29 and lets us in on one of the problems that's gone on. He says this, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. You hear the implication again? <laughs> the nine disciples tried to cast out an evil spirit and they didn't even think to pray. They see but not completely. Verse 30, 31, 32, Jesus again makes it absolutely crystal clear what he's about and what he's going to do. He says, I will be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill me. And when I'm killed, after three days, I will rise. No mistaking it. It is crystal clear. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And when he's killed, after three days, they will rise. But look at what verse 32 tells us. They did not understand the saying, and were too afraid to ask. They see just not clearly. In fact, they see with such blurry lines that verse 33 has to happen. They came to Capernaum and when the, he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? You hear those words? On the way? It's the same phrase that's come up. This is this, this absolutely packed little phrase full of so much implication. Disciples, what were you discussing on the way? Hear the response to him? They kept silent, for on the way, what have they been talking about? Not what it meant that he would die, not the implications for them, not who he was, not his identity, but this. They had argued with one another about who was the greatest. They see him, but not totally. They're following him, but then they default back to the ways that the world follows, where they play with power and control and want esteem and want position and want rank and want influence. And Jesus says, if you want to follow me, it's about giving up all of those things. It's not about those things. That's not what my kingdom looks like. My kingdom is not about manipulating, controlling people and using people as a means to an end. My kingdom is about glorifying God and being willing to lay down everything, everything to serve him. And instead, his disciples 
are arguing about their rank. Here's how I picture it. I mean, clearly they have to concede that Peter's number one. Everyone knows that. He keeps getting out of the boat. Peter always speaks up. I got to think if you're one of the other disciples, you're like, oh, why didn't I ask that? Peter's always up these rank, and then clearly John and James come in next because they got to go up in the mountain. And then you kind of duke it out among the others, sort of who's, you know, ranking above whom. And, and we want to know who's the greatest. But Jesus sat down and called the twelve in verse 35, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last and be the servant of all. He says, if, if you want to understand what my kingdom is about, you need to understand it's just, it is not about these kind of things. It's just not what we're concerned about. We're concerned with serving, not about the rank, not about position. One last story before we jump into chapter 10. Verse 38, John came to him and said, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. It sort of feels like this moment where you know, a student goes to the teacher and says, guess what good thing I did? You should be so proud of me. I want a pat on the head. Jesus, I saw someone doing things. And I stepped in and I made sure he stopped because he's not following us. Didn't I do a good job? And Jesus has to say to John, don't stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. He's saying, John, you just don't get it. You are not getting it. You're seeing enough to know that you should be following me. You're seeing enough to know that, yes, these things will be done in my name. But why aren't you grasping that my kingdom is not about control and stopping and hindering? Now, that's where we kind of end up in chapter 9 as Jesus works his way through that situation. And we want to pick up in chapter 10. And, oh, that was the introduction. Oh, the clock is, okay, we're good. I thought it was 12, but it's actually not. Whew, that was close, dodged a bullet. <clears throat> so we want to pick up here in chapter 10. And to do this, i got to do this multimedia extravaganza over here to help us navigate this. Because if you look at the bold heading in your Bible, you're probably thinking, why didn't he quickly pass over this part? Why all of chapter 9? Because chapter 10 brings up this very difficult and emotional and very hard issue of divorce. In fact, that's what my heading says, teaching about divorce. Now, that's a bit of a misnomer because I would suggest to you this morning that this is not primarily Jesus' theology of divorce. If you want to do that, you're going to have to go to some other places in Scripture and pull some pieces together. In fact, I think what's going on here in chapter 10 is just an ongoing series of Jesus confronting the issues the disciples have viewed as conventional wisdom and turning them on his head. So, in order to understand what's going to happen here, we need to understand a family tree. I got my cheat sheet so that I can follow my notes here. If you can't see this, <coughs> don't panic too much. I think it'll... Even the scribbles will, will help. You'll get the picture. You've probably heard in your Bible of a king named Herod. Um, he was the one, there's actually a number of them, that's where this gets a little confusing. Herod the Great was the king in control when Jesus was born. He was the one that attempted to put the babies to death in Bethlehem. Not attempted, he did. Um, he ruled from about 37 BC right up until the birth of Jesus Christ. Herod was a good friend with the Roman Emperor Augustus, and that's why he was allowed to have so much control and power in the nation of Israel. But Herod was also crazy. In fact, his enemies called him Herod the Mad. Um, and there was nowhere where his insanity sort of surfaced more than his family. Um, Herod's first wife was a woman named Doris. He had a son with her, um, Aunt Peter. Uh, and then Herod decided to kill the son and divorce his wife. Then he married again a woman named Miriam, who he loved dearly. At least everything we can read in history suggests he was absolutely devoted to this woman. Crazily so. Um, so crazy that anything that threatened this love, he would just simply destroy. That was kind of how he, he lived things out. So for example, when he first married her, wanting to kind of earn her love and show his devotion to her, he actually had her younger brother appointed as the chief priest of Israel. He was only 17 at the time. But then the whole plan backfired because 
Everyone loved her younger brother, and he became very much esteemed and very much a leader within Israel. And so Herod had him killed. He drowned him. And then Herod just decided for good measure to kill her mother and her grandpa too, just to make sure that there was no interference from the family. You can see why as much as he was devoted to her, she grew to hate him. But they did have some children. Um, Aristobus, and there was a bunch of others that he killed. But before he could kill Aristobus, he had three kids of his own, who I think were also killed, except for one girl named Herodias. She will figure in our story a little bit later. So you can see why now when we read in the gospel account that Herod decides to kill all the babies, that's just his technique. This is just kind of what he's been doing all along. You have problems, you just start killing people until the problems go away. The only problem is when he finally kills his wife, he is deeply remorseful right afterwards. In fact, he will forbid anyone from speaking about her death. In fact, he speaks about her as still being alive even though he's killed her. And he marries another woman, and we don't know if it's actually her name or not, but he calls her Miriam, same name. You see what he's doing, right? He's just going to pretend that she's actually not dead and she's still alive. And with this woman, he has another child, this one named Philip, whom he decides to leave alive. He, he's beginning to realize, I'm not going to live forever. I need someone to kind of carry on the family tree. Now what's complicated about this in our Bible is all these guys end up with the same first name. It's always Herod Philip. And so when you're reading in your Bible, you know, Herod does this and Herod does that. And you're thinking, how can this guy live for so long and be in so many places? You're reading about his kids and grandkids who all share the same name. Uh, eventually he divorces Miriam uh, and marries another woman. Her name's hard one to pronounce. Malthace, I think it is. And they have two kids, Archelaus, <coughs> excuse me, and Antipas. Um, and he leaves both of them alive. So now we've got a few people still surviving. Um, then he marries Cleopatra, not the one that we've all heard of, another one. Uh, she has a son. I'm pretty sure he kills him. Um, how many are we up to? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, there were two more in here. Uh, we don't know their names. They were his nieces, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They have a bunch of kids, but he kills all of them. There's Herod's happy family tree. Important part is to realize <clears throat> we have a few people left alive. And these two boys here. Herod eventually starts growing old. He gets sick along the way. He writes multiple wills, all sorts of wills. And he, he comes up with all sorts of absolutely insane instructions. And when he dies, no one knows what will will be in effect. And no one knows which of these three sons will inherit the kingdom. Ow. Like, in you know, a secret. It's this one, Archelaus. Who's crazy like his father, by the way. And his first action is to kill 3,000 Jewish people. And when you're king of Israel and you start killing Jewish people, you can imagine that this creates a problem. And so his brother Antipas decides, this is my golden opportunity. Everyone hates him. I will go to Rome and I will explain to the emperor what my crazy brother is doing and I will take over the kingdom. He gets to Rome. He explains to Augustus what's happening in Israel. He explains all the circumstances, what's going on. The emperor doesn't know what to do. And so he takes the easy way out. He just takes the country and divides it in three pieces. And says, you can have a piece, you can have a piece, and you can have a piece. Very soon after that, this brother dies, leaving two brothers remaining. Well, they're half-brothers. Antipas and Philip, who are actually good friends, interestingly enough. Antipas gets a certain region of the country to rule. In fact, if you look at Mark 10, verse 1... You read about it right here. The region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. That's actually a technical, beyond the Jordan isn't just like, oh, way over beyond the Jordan. That's actually a description of a physical area within the nation. That's what Antipas gets to rule. Everything else belongs to Philip. Now along the way, Philip decides he's going to get married and he marries his niece. Remember why she gets left alive and I said she was going to become important a little bit later in the story. He marries his niece, but unfortunately Antipas had always loved his niece as well. And so one day the two brothers take their two wives and travel to Rome. And on their way to Rome, Antipas says to Herodias, Herodias, I've always loved you. I would like you to marry me. There's only one problem. You recognize she's married already. You see how this could be a slight problem to Antipas' you know, his proposal. But he says, I want you to marry me. And she says, okay. 
I will marry you on one condition. You divorce your wife, and I will divorce my husband. Now, that is very unusual because we don't see much of that happening in history at all. In fact, it's almost unheard of that a woman would divorce her husband. They divorce. These two get married, and no one lives happily ever after. Okay. Bear that in mind for a second. Because if you don't know that, what's about to happen in Mark's Gospel and what we're about to read in this section is not going to make any sense. Because listen to what we read next. After he left there and went to the region of Judea, Mark 10 verse 1, and beyond the Jordan, crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. So he goes to the area controlled by this brother right here. Now, after this brother married Herodias, a man spoke out against it. One man said, this is not right. He's a man we've already come across in the Gospels. His name was John the Baptist. And because he spoke out against it, Antipas put him in prison. Herod Antipas put him in prison. And things got so bad that eventually Herodias, through her daughter, asked for his head on a platter and had him executed. And that's what happened to people who upset Antipas, because he learned it well from his father. If someone upsets you, if someone disagrees, have them killed. And so, on this day, Jesus crosses over into the territory controlled by this brother, and listen to what the Pharisees do. Verse 2. The Pharisees came up in order to test him, and they asked him one question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, please understand, everyone knew what they were asking. They might as well have asked, is it lawful for Antipas to divorce his wife? Because that's what they're getting after. They know if they can get Jesus just to say one small thing that would incriminate him, they can run over to Antipas and say, guess what? Remember that guy John, how he spoke it against you? He's got a cousin, his name is Jesus, and he's doing the same stunt. Arrest him, have his head cut off, and we'd finally be done with Jesus. So Jesus... Answer us this one now that you've stepped into his territory where he governs, he rules, and he executes justice. Is it wrong? Or is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? There was almost nothing Jesus could say now that would not incriminate him. You understand? I mean, how do you, how do you get out from this question? There was going to be no answer. But Jesus turns back to them and said, well... What did Moses command you? If you're going to start somewhere and start with your understanding and unwrap some of these very hard questions, start with Scripture. And so Jesus says, what did Moses tell you? And they said, well, it's pretty clear. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Thank you, Mark. They said, here's what Moses said. Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. That was permittable. You go back and read about it in the Old Testament. There are situations and circumstances because of sin that enters our world where that's what scripture tells us to do. Or permits. Maybe is a better way to say that. But look what Jesus says next. Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore a man will leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Isn't this an interesting answer? Remember what Jesus says. What did Moses say about this? They quote Deuteronomy 24 and Jesus says, actually, there's another passage that Moses wrote that goes back much further that I think is much more important. And he goes all the way back to Genesis that Moses also wrote. He said, here's where we're going to start. We're going to start with this crystal clear idea that God invented marriage. It was his proposal. And he said it's permanent. Now I understand, sitting in a room like this, there are all sorts of situations that have been difficult and hard. In fact, trust me, it's difficult and hard for me to get up and talk about this. Because I know, I know the stories. I don't even need to know yours without knowing that this is a tough passage to work our way through. And like I said before, there's other passages of Scripture. If we're going to wrestle through this completely, we need to read them as well. But here's what I've learned over the years, and this is why I feel like I can actually talk about this without trying to hide under my chair. Um, most of the people that I know that have gone through divorce or been hurt by divorce, they are not proponents of divorce. They aren't. In fact, most of the people I know that have experienced it or been affected by it would say, we sure hope our kids or our grandkids do not have to experience what we've gone through. See, I don't think there's many people who say, 
that divorce is the ideal road and we should all go down it. In fact, that's why I think we need to champion as the people of God, God's design and ideal for marriage, which is one man and one woman for a whole life, joined together by God. That's what Jesus points to. Now, Bear in mind, he's talking about this situation. He knows the question they're getting after. And the disciples do too. And so a little bit later in verse 10, the disciples come to him and ask him about this matter. In fact, one of the other Gospels, we actually find out that they come to him and say to him, Jesus, if that's the case, then it's better for us to just never get married. Right? They're confused. They're perplexed. They're going, Jesus, how does this work? And what I hope you see here is that everything that they have understood and believed is being turned on its head because they would have been taught since day one by the Pharisees that divorce was permitted, that there was a concession made because of our sin. And some Pharisees said, you could divorce for any reason. In fact, we actually have stories and situations where men were permitted to divorce because their wife burnt their cooking. Or because a man had seen a woman that he decided was actually more pretty than his wife. And the Pharisees, some of them said that was permissible. That was grounds. So you can understand being a disciple and hearing Jesus say this, why all of a sudden this starts sounding very difficult and they respond with that question. If that's the case, Jesus, that's probably better that we just don't ever marry in the first place. Because the world's being turned on its head. I hope you see that. But Jesus responds to them in verse 11. Make sure you see this before we move on. And here's what he says to them. Whoever divorces his wife, remember this picture? Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And verse 12, if she divorces her husband. Now please understand when he says that, that's unheard of. If you are a Jewish person, that's not even an option. That's like saying, you know, why don't you divorce your husband and fly to the moon? It was illegal, it was unperm- there was just no allowance in any sense of the word that this could even happen. So why would Jesus even bring it up? The disciples had to be sitting there going, that's just, you don't even have to say that because it's impossible for that to happen. Except that he's talking about this over here. If she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And Jesus has just addressed this exact situation the Pharisees were trying to set him up for. I hope we see that as we walk through this. He's not going to back down. He says, I understand, I'm walking right into Judea, I'm walking right to Jerusalem, and everything that John said is right. Now, we're not done, we've got two more stories to quickly see here before we try to wrap some things up this morning. Right after this comes verse 13, where people were trying to bring children to Jesus that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked him. Again, it's one of these strange situations where the disciples think they're doing a good thing only to find out that Jesus is saying, you are missing the point. Now again, there's some background to this because at this time, people would bring their kids to, to a famous rabbi to have them blessed, particularly around a major religious holiday. So Passover's coming up, the Easter story is about to start unfolding, and people are beginning to bring their kids to the rabbis. Forgive the analogy because it's a really imperfect one, but our closest thing would be people taking their kids to the mall to see Santa at Christmas. It was kind of like that, and I'm not comparing Jesus and Santa Claus, but that's kind of what was going on. And so they would bring their kids to a rabbi to be blessed. Now, there were some rules that governed this because you would never bother a really important rabbi. There were some who were just held in such high esteem that no one would ever imagine taking their kids to those men. They were just too important, too godly, too significant. And so you see what the disciples have in mind here. They see people bringing their kids and they rebuke them. Because they're really in essence saying, we see some things about Jesus very clearly. He is too important for this. These are just insignificant kids. And this is Jesus, the Messiah. Don't bother him with your kids. But Jesus, when he saw it, was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. You're seeing it partly, guys. You're seeing it partly. You know I'm important. But you don't see it clear enough to understand that in my kingdom, we're not going to send away kids. Now again, in his day and age, kids had a totally different value than they do today. Kids were actually treated like property. You probably saw in that, the slideshow looking at Pakistan that women were treated as property in Pakistan. In Jesus' day and age, kids were property. In fact, it was so extreme that if you didn't want one of your kids, you could just get rid of them like a piece of wood or an animal, and they were just gone, no longer considered your child, because they just had no value or status until Jesus comes along. 
and says, not in my kingdom. In my kingdom, the kingdom of heaven even belongs to these. He turns everything on its head. In fact, he goes on in verse 15 and says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now that one, we've got to be careful with because I've heard sermons and I've read stuff about that one that starts to kind of go down this really funny road that starts talking about how we need to you know, figure out what kids are like and imitate and they're so innocent and they're so trusting. And I've raised kids who are great young people now, but you all know uh, what little kids are like. Uh, little kids are a challenge and your job as a parent is to help them overcome greed, overcome wanting the biggest piece, overcome wanting everything to be about them. And I don't think the point is Jesus saying we need to go find kids and imitate them. I think his point is to say to his disciples, you have lived your whole lives with this understanding and expectation that they don't matter, that they have no worth and no value. But that will not be true of my kingdom and my people. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them and laid his hands on them. Next story. A rich young man, verse 17. And he was setting out on his journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now Mark, or sorry, Mark gives us a few details, but Matthew and Luke gives a lot more details. They tell us that not only was he young, but he was rich and he was a ruler. And Jesus goes on and he responds to him and says, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go and sell all you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in your heaven. And come and follow me. What on earth is going on with this story? Because again, put yourself in the spot of the disciples. You're this ragtag bunch of unqualified guys from Galilee. You've fished your whole lives. And you've heard Jesus all along say, we're going to call others and, and others are going to follow me. And, and, and we're on, on this way together. And then finally, this guy comes up, young, educated, wealthy ruler. And if you're one of the 12 disciples, you're going, this is, this is the star disciple. This is the guy we're waiting for and we're on our way to Jerusalem. What better moment than now to finally have a guy who, he's got some weight. If he, if he joins the team, everything could change. Jesus, don't lose this one. And not only that, but he's followed the law. He, he's obeyed everything. I mean, which one of us could say that? Which one of us could look Jesus in the eye and say, all these I have kept? None of us. But this man is devout not only to his faith, but he's, he is prominent. He's important. The disciples must have been thinking, finally, finally, we got it like a poster child for what it means to follow Jesus. If he is on our team, we can make a difference. Jesus, whatever you do, don't lose him. And then you hear what Jesus does. He does everything he can to shake him off the hook. Why do you call me good? No one's good but God. Oh, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything, give it away to the poor, and then come follow me. It's like Jesus picks the one thing as he looks into that man's heart and mind and knows that's the one deal breaker, the one thing he will not do. He goes away sorrowful because he had much. I've just got to think the disciples looked on with absolute horror. Jesus, how could you lose him at a time like this? Jesus looks around, looked around at his disciples. I think looked around at shock and said, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. How's that for deal breaker? How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. Why? Well, partly because our English does a real disservice to what Jesus just said. He doesn't actually use the word wealth. He uses what we would probably translate as stuff. But you go back and read that and doesn't all of a sudden that make you much more uncomfortable? Because there's something that, that's okay with this idea of, well, it's hard for the wealthy people, but thankfully, every Canadian is middle class. We just keep hearing that over and over in the news, right? Whew. Dodge that bullet. It's hard for the rich people. Whew. We're not rich. Read it properly. How difficult will it be for those who have stuff to enter the kingdom of God? I mean, do any of you have stuff? You start to feel all of a sudden that this is a much more difficult passage than it felt like about 30 seconds ago. And the disciples get it. They're astonished. They can't believe what Jesus is saying. He goes on. Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's been all sorts of stories and all sorts of ways to try to make that easier than what it sounds like. Some people have said there's a gate that, you know, there's this gate called the eye of the needle in Israel and a camel has to stoop on its knees to get in. There is no gate. It's never been found. It's, somewhat, it's a story. It would be great if it was. It would kind of make it easier. Others people have said, well, the word for thread and rope in Hebrew is very similar. So maybe what's, maybe Jesus is saying it's hard to like thread a needle with a rope. It's, it's tough, but it can be done. Have you ever tried to thread a needle with just thread? I mean, I can't I, clumsy fingers. I can't even do that. Imagine trying to thread it with rope. The point is, it's impossible. In fact, that's what he's going to get to next. Here is conclusion. When the disciples ask him this question, because they get the implication, they ask him, well, then who can be saved? If that's the standard, we put two and two together, and Jesus, here's the question we've got to ask you. It sounds like you're saying no one gets saved. And here's Jesus' response. With man, it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And if you're sitting in this room and you have a relationship with God, if you are among those who are saved, it's a miracle. And it has nothing to do with how bad you are. It's a miracle because for anyone to be saved, it is the work of God. Because with man it's impossible, but not with God. Now if you were to choose three topics... If you just had a blank piece of paper and I said, choose, like, choose the three biggest topics that you could get ooh, you could get some big debate going over and discussion. They would hit close to home and you could get some people worked up. What might they be? I mean, I mean we could pick some. Probably, probably money would be among them. That's a tricky one. Wouldn't kids and parenting be among them? And probably marriage, divorce. I mean, those are, those are big ones. If you want to get a reaction, that's where you go. And you see what Mark has just done? You see what Jesus has just done? Over the course of this chapter, he has picked out the biggest issues that he could comment on. So let me just talk to you a bit about marriage and divorce. Now let me talk to you a little bit about kids and parenting. Now let me talk to you about money in your pocketbook. And what he did is just systematically turn the world up on its head. It's so everything you've understood, everything you've believed, just turn it and spin it upside down. Now again, hopefully at this point, wouldn't we just love to have the disciples say, ah, we finally get it. Jesus, we've missed it all along, but now we get it. Your way is different. Oh, we see. We were confused. We thought it was just sort of like a modified version of what we always believed, that, that you were going to be more powerful and more in control, but now we see what you're actually suggesting is that we sacrifice everything and submit everything and serve God and not live for our own pleasure and our own interests and our own glory, but God's. And instead, Peter pipes up and says, Oh, Jesus, this is fantastic. Now, this is sort of my modified version. You're not going to find it quite like this in verse 28, but I think this is what's going on. Jesus, I was confused because I thought the rich young guy, I thought he was like the perfect disciple. And I thought he would vault right to the top of the class. You remember how they were ranking each other first? Because I knew I was number one before, but I was even prepared. If this guy came on board, he could be number one, and I'd be like the number two. But Jesus, if it's true... That those with stuff can't get in. And if it's true that those with stuff actually are out, then it must also be true that those of us with nothing are at the top of the class. Here's what he says. Jesus, look at me. I left everything and followed you. Jesus, good news. I am number one. I've got nothing. Isn't that what's happening? It's happening all through the story. They just don't get it. They're so concerned with rank and who's first and who's most important and who counts. And Jesus says to him, Truly I tell you, there's no one who left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or land for my sake or for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. Oh, with persecutions. It's all going to come with a cost. Jesus will never hide that. But Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, you didn't lose anything. You've gained a family. You've gained brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. You have gained in following me, both now and into eternity. But Peter, verse 31. Peter, make sure you understand this. And this is where we're going to end up today. Peter, many who are first will be last. And the last will be first. Because Peter, my kingdom does not work 
the way you still think it works, the way you still insist it works, you see a, a moment, a vulnerable moment, a moment you can move in and somehow gain advantage. Peter, it just doesn't work that way. And Peter, don't make the mistake of thinking it works that way, only at the very end to find out you're last. See, I think many of us maybe live in that in-between land. In between where we see Jesus is important. And we hear that he's worth listening to. And we see he matters enough that we've taken some steps to follow him, but we haven't quite gotten to the point where we've said, he matters so much that I will let him turn my life upside down. And we live in this in-between land where the disciples are right here in Mark 8, 9, and 10. We follow him, but we haven't got it figured out. We haven't grown accustomed to new type of kingdom living. The kind of living that Jesus says, follow me in this. Follow me in not counting rank. Follow me in sacrificing yourself. And I want to leave you with a question, just a very simple question as we come to an end here this morning. Next week we'll pick up again in Mark chapter 10. And here's the question. Do you believe him enough to let him turn your life upside down? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I have no doubt as we look through these stories in Mark 10, there's not a single one of us who's altogether comfortable with what we read. Father, for some of us, it's this talk of marriage and divorce that brings up maybe old or fresh wounds. And maybe even at that point, we, we sort of check out to the rest of the message and struggle with that moment. Others, maybe it's this issue of parenting and kids and the value of kids and how we go about raising them. For others, the, the pain starts when we start talking about money and pocketbooks and that kind of sacrifice. But Father, as we look at these stories collectively, we understand that Jesus is teaching and demonstrating that his kingdom looks different. And Father, we want to be among those who see so clearly that we would gladly and willingly allow our lives to be turned upside down for him. And so please, allow us to see that way. Have a mercy on us in this. Allow our hearts to trust and believe and have courage that we could allow you to change our lives and our world for the sake of your Son and his gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.